Thank you very much for joining today's webinar, Managing Global Uncertainties, Seizing Global Opportunities, in partnership with Active Asset Management. Um, today we have speakers from Active Asset Management, first with uh, Professor Kishore Babubani, Chairman of Active Asset Management, Eric Kong, Executive Director, and Harry Gold, Head of Special Projects. Before we begin, let's watch a short video. Speaker, I think he needs no introduction, is uh, Professor Kishore, the gentleman on my right, and um, he was Singapore's ambassador to the UN and the US. He was also PermSec at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and currently distinguished fellow at uh, Asia, Asia Research Institute at the NUS. I may have left out a few things, but I'll be here all morning if I introduce. Paul is about you. Prof is the author of many books, uh, most are quite provocative, may I say, including Can Asians Think? Has China Won? Uh, and more latterly, Has the West Lost It? A Provocation, and The Asian 21st Century. And these are the books I've read. There are several that I haven't. Okay. Prof's topic this morning is Has China Won or Lost from the Ukraine War? Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Uh... I want to begin by saying that we are meeting on a very sad day. Uh, the world is completely shocked uh, by the brutal assassination of former Prime Minister Abe. And it's shocking because Japan is uh, one of the safest countries in the world. Indeed, in many ways, it's safer uh, than Singapore. So we are all saddened by this, and I therefore we want to begin by conveying our condolences to the family of Prime Minister Abe and to the people of Japan uh, for this very sad loss. Speaking also as um, Chairman of Aggregate uh, Asset Management, uh, as you know, we have gone through a very um, turbulent time, but as for all of us who have invested in uh, many places, we know that the performance of aggregate has been much better uh, than anyone else and that's of course because of the unique philosophy of uh, aggregate of diversifying its portfolio as we shall uh, discover today. So the main question that I would answer today is has China won or lost from the Ukraine war? But to explain the complexity I will try to answer three questions. Uh, the first question will be, what exactly is China's position uh, on the Ukraine war? Second question, how has China lost? Third question, how has China won? And uh, I hope that as I try to answer these questions, you'll begin to understand the complexity of China's position so let me begin by answering the first question, what exactly is China's position? And here I want to begin with the important word of warning. If you want to understand China's position uh, on the Ukraine war, don't trust the Anglo-Saxon media. Because if you read the Anglo-Saxon media, and I give you a couple of examples like the Economist, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you will get a very black and white picture of China's position on the Ukraine war saying, oh, China is taking Russia's side and therefore China is wrong and China is evil and China should be condemned. And of course, that black and white picture is completely wrong because it is very clear that China has not supported Russia in its invasion of Ukraine in any way. Of course, China hasn't condemned Russia, but then China is not alone there. One of the best friends of the West is the largest democracy in the world, India. And India also actually hasn't condemned Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, because in geopolitics, everything is very complicated. Countries like China and India and South Africa or Brazil 
have to weigh a lot of considerations before they work out what their positions are. They have their own national interests. And so China has actually been very, very careful about the position it's taken on Ukraine war. It hasn't uh, condemned Russia, but at the same time, it's kept up its ties with Ukraine. And indeed, actually, the Ukrainian government still maintains good relations with China. And Ukraine has always been actually a major trading partner of China, and China is doing its best uh, to keep up uh, its trade with uh, Ukraine. And I suspect quietly behind the scenes, also trying to find ways and means uh, of seeing whether a solution uh, can be found. And of course, you will see more of that uh, in the G20 meeting, uh, which is actually taking place today as we speak in uh, G20 foreign ministers meeting, which is taking place today in, in, in Bali. But overall, the key point I want to make is that China could have actually taken a position of fully supporting uh, Russia in this war, but it's been very careful to ensure that it's kept a certain uh, distance from it. And of course, it's true that uh, uh, China's and Russian leaders did say, as you know, in February this year, they met just before the invasion of Ukraine, and they did issue a statement saying there are no limits to the partnership between uh, China and Russia. But that, I think, was referring to the broader relationship. And here, the, in the broader relationship, it's quite natural for China and Russia to come together because both are under severe pressure from the West, for different reasons, by the way. Because Russia is clearly not seen as a long-term challenge or threat to Western dominance, certainly American dominance. But China is clearly seen as a threat to uh, um, uh, certainly American dominance. And as you all know, a major geopolitical contest uh, has broken out between uh, United States and, and China. And of course, you want to, if you want to understand the origins, the structural forces that are driving it, what will be the outcome, who will win this US-China contest. I've actually documented all that in my book, Has China Won, uh, which is available. And, and, and if you want to know more about that, subject, I would suggest you look at that book. And of course, it's because of that larger geopolitical contest with China under pressure from the West that it has kept up its partnership uh, with Russia. But if you read my book, uh, Has China Won, you will also say, you will also see, and this was written two years ago, uh, that on the China-Russia relationship over the long run, they will actually have divergent goals because in many ways, even though right now, Russia's main focus, main pressure is coming from the West, from Europe, and so on and so forth. In the long run, Russia will worry more about the rise of China. Russia has the longest border with China. And so in, in the long run, actually, it's conceivable that Russia and Europe may actually come together and, and, and work together. So I, I'm going to emphasize all this because I began my remarks by saying that this whole uh, geopolitical uh, situation is very complex. And I hope that my remarks so far have brought out and drawn out the complexity of the subject and, and in many ways differ sharply from the simple black and white perspective that you get from the Anglo-Saxon media, which frankly is downright wrong. So if you see an article from The Economist or from the New York Times on China and Russia, be very wary. Don't trust them because they have an agenda in what they're writing and they have actually, they're not being uh, fair and accurate and objective uh, in their reporting uh, on the subject. And I see, you also see this comes out as I now talk about the second, answer the second and third questions. The second question I want to answer, of course, is, uh, has China lost? And here I want to say very categorically that initially, in the initial phase uh, after the Ukraine war, it's very clear that China has lost in the short term and lost in actually uh, four different ways. The first way in which uh, China has lost is that, you know, the year 2022 is actually a very important year 
uh, in China's political transition. There will be a very important party congress in October, November this year. And the likelihood is that President Xi Jinping will get a third term. And that's, as you know, uh, unprecedented in recent times. And therefore, that's a major political transition that's going to take place in China in October, November. And what President Xi wanted was a year of calm and stability in 2022. Instead, he's had to deal with two, in a sense, uh, major, I would call them almost like monsters of challenges. First is managing the exit out of the zero COVID policy, which is going to be a big challenge for China. And second, handling the uh, ramifications uh, of the Ukraine war. So in a year in which China wanted calm, is getting a tremendous amount of turbulence. And therefore, in that sense, the Ukraine war has been, you know, uh, uh, a challenge uh, uh, for China. And the second way in which uh, uh, China has lost out is that, as you know, as I explained, uh, since both China and Russia are under pressure, they have developed a partnership which is a natural thing to fend off the geopolitical pressures, the common geopolitical pressures that they feel. And it would be clearly in China's interest to see its partner, Russia, strengthen. Uh, instead, and this is not, not a secret, Russia clearly has been weakened uh, by the Ukraine war. We all know that when President Putin launched his invasion on February 24th, especially when he sent his tanks heading straight towards the capital, Kiev. I think he was going to, he thought that I'm just going to launch a blitzkrieg operation, take over the capital city. The people of Ukraine will welcome the Russian troops and we will have a quick victory. I mean, he never said that that was his expectation, but that's what the behavior seemed to show. And as you know, it didn't work out. In fact, phase one of the Russian operation was a disaster real magnificent disaster. And at the end of the day, there was a rather ignominious retreat of the Russian tanks uh, away from the capital city. And of course, there was a lot of celebration, exaltation in the West about this uh, uh, Russian defeat. And they thought, well, Ukraine's going to win the war. But I think the West, once again, has seriously underestimated uh, Russian resolve. And clearly, the Russians are now going to carry on in an operation which I call a slow grinding operation to increase their space in Ukraine. And here it is conceivable uh, that Russia can win uh, in the long run. You'll have to wait and see. But in any case, clearly the war in Ukraine has proven to be a bigger challenge for Russia than Russia anticipated. Western sanctions have hit Russia. So Russia has been weakened, and with the weakening of Russia, this clearly is a setback uh, for uh, China too. That's the second way in which China has been uh, negatively affected. The third way in which uh, China has been negatively affected is that in trying to manage its rise, China has realized a long time ago, and if you look at my book as China One, I say even over 20 years ago, China anticipated a kind of uh, some kind of American containment policy on China. And to try and ward off that containment policy, China did many things. But one of, the, one of China's hopes was to try and deal with the United States and Europe as two separate entities with separate interests and trying to make sure that the two didn't unite themselves against China. And for a long time, that was true. Europe actually had an independent policy uh, towards China. In some areas, they agreed with the United States, but in other areas, for example, especially in trade, uh, they stepped up their trade and uh, connections with uh, China. And China was more or less dealing with the United States and Europe separately, which is, of course, in China's interest. But then one of the uh, most striking outcomes of the Ukraine war has been this remarkable coming together of the United States and Europe in a tremendous revitalization of Western solidarity. And now China uh, has to deal with a strong United West rather than a divided West within the United States and Europe. And that is geopolitically, frankly, more uncomfortable for China. And as you know, the latest meeting uh, between the European leaders and Chinese leaders 
proved to be difficult and fractious uh, because the Europeans took the view that China should automatically support the European position on the Ukraine war, which of course was very unrealistic. So there, so therefore, this revitalization of Western solidarity uh, is also a setback uh, for China. Of course, you have to wait and see how long this Western solidarity lasts, but we can talk about that uh, later. And in the fourth way in which um, uh, China has lost out uh, from the Ukraine war is that for a long time, uh, China thought that it had this incredible assets, its total reserves, which were about $3.2 trillion. Today, it's about $3 trillion uh, of foreign reserves, which they saw as assets that they could use to protect China. And lo and behold, they were absolutely shocked to see how half of Russia's central bank reserves uh, out of 680 billion, I think 340 billion were seized by the West and frozen by the West. So clearly uh, now China sees that what is foreign reserves, which it saw as assets uh, could turn into liabilities if it could be just be frozen overnight uh, by the West and Western banks and so on and so forth. So this clearly has become a strategic, therefore setback uh, uh, for China. And, and they are clearly now China is, must be thinking very hard, how do I protect myself from future uh, Western sanctions and how do I protect my reserves and so on and so forth. So you can see on all these counts that I mentioned, the, the stability that President Xi wanted this year, the partnership uh, with Russia, the unification of the West and the vulnerability of the foreign assets, foreign assets that China has in all these areas, China has lost out from the uh, Ukraine war. So now then, therefore, let me turn to the next question, which, uh, which is how has China won uh, from the Ukraine war? And here it's, while well, in the initial phase, as I said, China has lost out as this war is dragging out, and nobody, by the way, still knows what the final outcome is going to be. We are beginning to see the emergence of new trends uh, that could work uh, in the favor uh, of, of, of China. So for example, uh, I mentioned there has been a revitalization of Western solidarity. And up to now, the West has been completely united on the Ukraine war. But it is conceivable that as the war drags on and as the costs increase, especially for the domestic populations in United States and in Europe, you will find that there might be a domestic backlash in both these countries against the continuation uh, of the war. And as you know, uh, gasoline prices in the US have gone up very, very uh, sharply. And that is actually putting a lot of pressure uh, on the administration of President Joe Biden. And as you know, President Joe Biden and his Democratic Party are very much focused on the midterm elections in November. And if, if, if inflation continues to rise, and if uh, things get very difficult for the middle classes in America, that could be a political backlash against President Joe Biden. And therefore, there could be some pressures to find some kind of a solution uh, in Ukraine instead of taking the very hardline position that the United States has taken uh, on the Ukraine war. Uh, in the same way, it's also possible that you might get a summer of unrest uh, in many European countries if inflation rises and if energy prices remain very high. And certainly even a country like France, uh, which has been quite stable, as you saw in the last elections, uh, there was a, while President Macron did get reelected as president, he lost the, what you call the legislative assembly uh, elections. And though he has to deal with a much more difficult domestic environment, so even in Europe, which today seems very strong and united uh, on the Ukraine war, there might be a certain degree of exhaustion over it. 
and therefore reconsideration of the effects, and therefore perhaps the strong uh, Western resolve that you have seen so far may weaken uh, in the weeks and months uh, to come, and therefore that will change the balance uh, between the West uh, and, and China. And at the same time, uh, there's one statistic which I want you to remember, it's a very important statistic, which is that only 12% of the world's population lives in the West. 88% lives outside the West. And initially, certainly initially, when the Russian invasion of Ukraine happened, it shocked the world. And clearly you saw that over 140 states, I think, condemned the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine in the UN General Assembly vote. So you got the sense that the West and the rest were united in their approach towards the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But again, over time, you see that even though the West has tried to apply very strong sanctions on Russia, and the sanctions have been quite brutal in some ways, quite effective, you, you actually discover that if you look at the population of the world, the, the, the percentage of the world's population in the countries that have actually uh, imposed sanctions on Russia is only like 14 or 16 percent of the world's population. And uh, 84 to 85 percent of the world's population have not imposed sanctions uh, on Russia. And in fact, are now saying very clearly to the West, this war in Ukraine is not just damaging the people on Ukraine. The people of Ukraine are clearly suffering and we should support the people of Ukraine if they're suffering in this war. But the rest of the world is also suffering. The war in Ukraine, as I suggested earlier, has increased uh, global inflation, increased global energy prices, increased food prices, and therefore uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, in many third world countries are actually going to go hungry as a result of the Ukraine war. And the sheer indifference of the West to the pain and suffering of the poor in third world countries is becoming now very clear and palpable and therefore leading in some ways to a backlash against the West, against the West on the Ukraine issue. And in that sense, in some ways, China's position, uh, as I indicated earlier, is more in tune with the position of most uh, third world countries. And actually China, as you know, has tried to be helpful uh, to many of them in, 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 in different ways. So paradoxically, what initially seemed to be, in a sense, a global, united global uh, response against the Russian invasion of Ukraine now seems very much more, very much as a Western response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine with very little support uh, from the majority of the countries. Uh, in the 88% of the world's population who live outside the West. So in that sense, it's become very much a shift away uh, from the global united response. And, and this is also shown uh, in the positions that are taken by the larger countries uh, in the third world. And certainly, and you will see this uh, ha, uh, play out, by the way, both in the G20 foreign ministers meeting taking place today, uh, that more and more uh, major third world countries like India, like Indonesia, like Brazil, like South Africa saying, hey, we shouldn't just focus on the war in Ukraine, we should focus on uh, uh, ending the war in Ukraine, working for a ceasefire and trying to find peace in Ukraine because the problems in Ukraine are disrupting lives, not just in Ukraine, but disrupting lives uh, all over the world. And just yesterday, I got a WhatsApp message uh, from a senior Indonesian diplomat in Bali saying that it's very clear that the majority of the G20 countries are speaking out to say, hey, Let's work harder uh, for peace uh, in, in Ukraine. So I think the West, therefore, I think will begin to find that initially what they thought was the, them working with the rest of the world uh, on the subject, they find that the rest of the world is now moving away uh, uh, from them. And if the West wants to understand this better, 
I think what they should do is to study very carefully a country that the West is very comfortable with now. And actually in many ways, you know, sometimes many in the West see as a now a new ally of the West. And of course that country is India. India is the world's largest democracy. So when the West says that, hey, this is, a, this is a, as you know, it's been said many times by the West, this is a contest within democracies and autocracies. And if they really believe that, then they should ask themselves the question, what is the position of the world's largest democracy, which is India? Now, India clearly didn't approve of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, India also didn't condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And even if you want to understand why, there are actually very sound uh, historical reasons why India hasn't condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine. For a start, uh, this is a, a fact. Uh, India still gets most of its arms from Russia. This is a legacy going back to the days of the old Soviet Union when actually, as you know, uh, the United States actually was the country that was applying pressure on India, certainly after India invaded East Pakistan uh, to uh, liberate the people of East Pakistan, in, uh, which later became the state of Bangladesh. And at that time, as you all know, the United States actually sent an aircraft carrier, both President Nixon and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger sent an aircraft carrier into the Bay of Bengal to threaten India. And from those days, India switched to move closer to Moscow and uh, bought most of its arms from Moscow and still continues to do so today. So that's one reason why India uh, obviously have, have wanted to maintain its close ties with Russia. And equally importantly, and I say this as someone who was ambassador to the UN for over 10 years, uh, one a very the most powerful uh, international body in the world is the UN Security Council. Is the, the UN Security Council is the only body in the world that can uh, impose mandatory sanctions on on all countries in the world. So when India was having problems with its neighbors, and India wanted uh, 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 one permanent member of the UN Security Council to support it, and as you know, there are five permanent members in the UN Security Council: United States, China, UK, France, and Russia. Uh, the only permanent member that has always been consistently sympathetic to India's position and in fact vetoed any uh, measures that could uh, damage India, that country was uh, Russia. So there is a very deep well of trust within India towards Russia, which is not going to be removed by uh, the Ukraine war and which also explains why India is taking a very careful, independent uh, position uh, on the uh, Ukraine war. So here, if the West wants to understand uh, what is China's position uh, on the Ukraine war, actually, even though the interests of China and India are different uh, in many ways, in many areas, and of course, of course you also know there is some rivalry between China and India uh, in many significant areas. Despite all that, when it comes to the Ukraine war, there's a remarkable coincidence of views between uh, China and India uh, on the Ukraine war. And so therefore, if the West is trying to understand China's position, it's got to understand that China is not isolated uh, in its position on the Ukraine war. In some ways, China's position is actually more in harmony with the position of most countries in the world than that uh, uh, of the West uh, towards the Ukraine war. So I hope that in all my remarks today, what I have done is to bring out the, 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 the complexity of the subject. And, and I hope that that will enable you to have a better understanding of one of the most difficult and problematic issues of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you very much, Mark. That was very insightful, and I'll watch this again so that I can digest it and write about it. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Eric. Eric is a fund manager and ex executive director of Aggregate Asset Management. Um, he was a partner in a boutique investment fund house before he co-founded. He's one of the co-founders of Aggregate Asset Management in 2012. Um, he's experienced in managing assets with sovereign funds, high net worth individuals, 
and um, other institutions. His previous work experience also includes the Ministry of Defense, Motorola, Citibank, UOB, and uh, he is a CFA charter holder. Need I say more, Eric? Uh, Eric's um, presentation is on the important tenets of investing to successfully navigate through tumultuous times. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank um, the investors uh, who have made uh, aggregate asset management what it is today. So uh, without uh, further delay, uh, let, let me uh, get on with my presentation. So the thing is that if I put it simply, how do you stay sane and stick to your investment plan in uh, periods like this? So we started 2022 uh, with a war. We have talks of inflation and then we have a coming recession. And you know, two years ago, we had COVID and we are, hard, we are not really uh, you know, gotten rid of COVID yet. So how is the investor going to stay, um, stick to his plan, investment plan? So this is what most uh, investors do. They buy on the way up and then bad news, they, they sell their stocks, right? Or they reduce their portfolio. So this is something that um, many people do and they keep repeating that. So you don't really want to do that. So how do you um, refrain from doing that? So there's two things I want to talk about. First, you have to think of the big picture. So what is the big picture? You need to know the big picture. And after that, you have to go down into the details and need to know the so-called uh, small picture so that you can stick to your investment plan. So this is the big picture. So this is Singapore in 1962. And if you total up the assets of um, you know, companies, people, probably you get X. And today, in 2022, you get a 58-fold um, return in over 60 years. And that's a 7% uh, per annum nominal return. Of course, some days could be sacrificed. There are less trees and you know, maybe artificial trees that you can spot. But then, how, how did this happen? So uh, these are the people who have uh, contributed. So if you, know, you are feeling kind of... Uh, depressed or stressed or panicky uh, when the stock markets are crashing, just go down to the train station. So what are all these people doing? You know, they are brushing up their PowerPoint slides. They are making that plate of wonton me. They are using their creativity, trying to do better. Basically, they're exchanging their lives and their hours for um, exchanging their energy for money to feed their family and all that. So if you see this, you stick to the plan, right? That's what you should do. So that may, that may sound airy-fairy and you know, big picture kind of thing, but let's get down to the details. So I put this as the perpetual energy machine. So what does that mean? You know, people have tried to invent the perpetual machine, meaning that the machine that can go on in motion forever without additional uh, energy, that's not possible because it violates the law of thermodynamics. But in finance, there's this perpetual energy machine. Not only it generates perpetual energy, but it snowballs as well. So what is it? This is the secret of the rich. Why the rich keeps getting richer, why the gaps keep getting wider, and why the poor remains uh, you know, poor. So this is a secret. This is actually company A, which is actually a stock. So if you buy a stock, you are buying a share of a business. So let's begin at the beginning. So just say you put in $100 of capital in company A. After one year, if it runs a ROE or return on equity of 10%, you are going to get $10 profits. So that's simple, right? $100, you get $10 profits. So where did that $10 profits go? $5 goes out as dividends. The other $5, is reinvested profits, meaning that it goes back to the company. And now the company has a bigger base at $105. So can you see that it has grown slightly bigger? And if the profits are reinvested properly at 10%, the next year, you get $10.50 profits. So you have noticed that the profits has increased slightly, and that is split 
in the dividends, the shareholder now get $5.25 and the other $5.25 goes back to the company. And again, the company gets a little bigger, right? So where is the magic here? You can see that the base got bigger, dividends got bigger over time, profits got bigger over time. So not only is it a perpetual energy, but it also generates uh, more profit. So it's like a snowball kind of thing. So that's why you want in uh, on this game. So you might ask, how did that 10% come about? Is it really 10%, right? So later I'll show you why I put 10% there. Then the other thing you, you will notice, just say if you buy Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't have such a mechanism. It doesn't get bigger. Nothing gets reinvested. You know, you just depend on another guy to take it off your hand at a higher price. You just hope that that is going to happen. So if you try to draw a diagram for Bitcoin here, it's not going to work. So let's, uh, now I say, you know, it's spinach time. We really need to get into the details. So if you understand this, you will not feel, um, you will not do the wrong thing during market panics. So I went down the STI index. Then I happened to choose Wilma just as an example. But Wilma, you know, they are run by uh, people with a great load of common sense. So let's see uh, that company itself. Live explain. The equity is a yellow, is an orange uh, line. It goes up over time, which means that the company um, grew over time. And the reason is because if you look at the profits, profits are generated every year. The green line, it fluctuates. Yeah, profits fluctuate. It could be the commodity cycle. It could be other external events, or it could be a business issue, profits fluctuate. But you see that the profits, part of it goes into dividends, distributed as dividends, and that dividends grow over time, and equity grows over time. So this is just Wilma showing you um, that it's actually a perpetual energy machine, right? Okay, so if you look at uh, Wilma, you look at, um, the so-called uh, earning power of that of this company. Just now I said 10%, right? So in this case, Wilma, if you look at the ROE, on average is about 7 to 8%, which means that this company, the average earning power, you can get 7, 8% return on your money. Of course, if you look at the first few years after IPO, right, the, on the back of uh, good earnings, the ROE is higher, but generally up, given some time, you can see that the power is 7 to 8%. And sometimes this is also a warning against, uh, you know, uh, evaluating the company over too short a period after IPO. So you need to take a longer perspective. So that's the micro picture. And now, um, if you look at it, that big blue circle. So what I'm trying to say is that the gray line is a market cap. Market cap means it's a value of the company. You take share price multiplied by number of shares. That's the value of the company. So that big circle shows you that over time, the value of the company should track the base of the company, the equity of the company, right? So it slowly goes upward over time. So it doesn't matter whether, you know, who is tweeting what profits start fluctuating. It doesn't really matter. This is what really matters. This is a, uh, um, I show this slide because I just want to show you something. If you look at the net profits, the green line fluctuates, right? And the market cap, so-called the value of the company, you know, in the short term, it fluctuates with the net profit. Net profit comes down, value of company comes down, right? And, but over time, it should track the, 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 that gray line of market cap should track the yellow line of equity. It should track it over time, provided that the ROE uh, remains uh, uh, stable, meaning that excess profits are reinvested at a sensible rate. So then, I just show you Wilma. I show you that perpetual energy machine with company A. So what am I trying to tell you? That is a micro picture. That is a detail. So you can't really predict the movement of an individual company, right? I mean, you can't even predict the movement or the direction of a country. What not about an individual company? But you can predict the general direction of a group of companies. So this is an important point. As a group, you can predict what happens, but not at the individual level. You know, this one is from uh, Harry Seldon. Okay, so what is the group of companies? 
what is the earning power? So you look at it, um, this is just all the US companies from 1963 to 2003. But of course, you know, you want to know what is the latest number, but generally it covers between nine to 10%. So the average US company can make nine to 10% on capital. This is slightly more updated. Um, it shows the S&P 500, meaning that the, the, the stocks of the S&P 500, 500 companies in the S&P 500 index. So over here, you look at it. What is the ROE, the earning power? It's about 12%, 12 to 13%. And this is as of uh, from 93 to 2019. So of course, you notice during crisis years, right? The great financial crisis in 08. Yeah, it dropped to like, 3% return on equity. Then in uh, 2001, after the dot-com crash, it dropped to like 7% return on equity. But you can see that it's still positive, right? So as long as it is positive, as long as it, it is positive, it keeps adding to your, your equity, your equity base. The company gets larger and larger. So if you understand this, then you would not be... Uh, you will not do the wrong thing and not be so fearful of market panics. So then, these are the basic concepts. So how do you build your own uh, portfolio? How do you make it more robust? You obviously wouldn't just want to invest in one company, right? Like Tesla or Netflix or whatever, it doesn't matter. You don't want to do that. So you want to make things more robust. And obviously, you just don't want to invest in just a single country, right? Because, you know, you can't predict what happens to countries, right? So then if you look at it, the step one to make it more robust, you have to add countries to your portfolio. So what is the optimal number of countries? Based on research, based on studies, it's actually 20 countries, right? But it's okay. If you don't have that kind of money, you can just start with a few. Okay, why you need to add countries? If you have invested in the Singapore market, you know, for the last 15 years, the Singapore market in 2000, before the great financial crisis, it was at 3,800 points, the STI. Now what is it? 3,100. So you have gone nowhere if you have invested in the Singapore market, right? It shows from here. So you think that maybe it's smart if I invested in another country to offset this. So then you chose another country. You chose Hong Kong. So what happened in Hong Kong? Yeah. Before the great financial crisis, it was 32,000 points. Now it is 22,000 points. So for 14 years, it went nowhere. Yeah, we can go into the reasons why it went nowhere. It could be the political change the, 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 and that kind of thing, right? But you can see that we never expected the political uh, changes in Hong Kong. So it went nowhere for 14 years. So in a way, your portfolio... If you, have been in, if you are a Singaporean, you are a Hong Konger, you have invested in these two countries, you have gotten nowhere. So what if you have uh, added Japan? Okay, you notice Japan for the last 30 years, it went nowhere. But the last 10 years, from 2010 to now, okay, Japan has sort of went fivefold. It has, go, it has gone fivefold in the last 10 years. So if you had Japan, yes, right it will have sort of buffered the negatives from Singapore and Hong Kong. It will have put on gains on your portfolio. But if, what if you are Japanese and you started investing in 19, uh, 1990, you know you will still be underwater. So the moral of the story is diversify your portfolio, right? Next, US. So what happened in US? Last 10 years, great guns, you know. The, 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 the numbers uh, is like it, it quadrupled, right? Fourfold if you have invested in US the last 10 years. But what about from 2000 to 2010? That's a 13 year, um, look at the rate, rate bar, 13 year the US went nowhere. But only the last 10 years it did very well. So that's why you need more countries in your portfolio. So step two, how to make it more robust? Step two is you have to add stocks and you can't just add one or two stocks. The reason is because you need many stocks to be diversified. So then the next thing is you need to equal weight the stocks, meaning that you give it equal dosage, not more, not less. You just need to equal it. You don't want to put 30% of your money 
into a hot stock, you don't want that 30% into a SIA or 30% into SPH or retirement. So you, you don't want to do that, right? Because anything can happen. So add stocks, add countries. So what do you get? So this is what our perpetual energy machine looks like, right? So 1,500 stocks, multiple countries, almost equal weighted. And you put that here into the grand design, it's pretty much, you put that here into the grand design, it's pretty much indestructible, right? So there are thousands of stocks, there are 20 countries or more. You know why you have to do that? First, it's your retirement money. You are not going to put $10,000 into this. You are not going to put $50,000 into this. No, because you want that 10% return. You want that 8% compounded, 10% compounded, whatever. You want a high single digit. So that's why you need to put serious sums of money. And if you put serious sums of money, you don't want it to be destroyed. So that's why you have to build it in such a way. So, you know, that was a hand-drawn picture, but if I just show you a picture of our fund, this is what it looks like. Thousands of stocks, more or less equal weighting. This is what we look like. But what about the index? What if you decide to buy the index? This is what the index looks like. You buy the ETFs, right? So just say you are a Korean or you want to buy the MSCI Korea index. You want to buy the MSCI Korea index. So one quarter of Korea, you look at that little blue uh, triangle, that is Samsung Electronics. So you buy the Korea, meaning that you put one quarter of your money into Samsung Electronics. Then you look at MSCI Taiwan. You put money into MSCI Taiwan, the ETF or whatnot. You are putting one quarter of your money again into Taiwan Semiconductor. What about Hong Kong? So you put in Hong Kong, in this case, MSCI Hong Kong, one quarter is AIA Group. Then the next uh, one third is uh, Hong Kong exchange. What about STI? You say that, you know, let's buy the STI. It's really, is a good hedge and so on and so forth. What are you buying actually? Basically you buy the STI, you are buying DBS, OCBC, UOB and Singtel. That's half of your portfolio. You are basically buying the bank stocks. What about the S&P 500? Okay, you look at S&P 500, you can see that most of it is Apple, Microsoft, uh, Tesla, Facebook, and so on. The tech stocks made up like one third of it. So buying the index is not really diversified, just, just to let you know. Then there are many questions that I get. This is a favorite one. People ask me, what if, is it a good time to invest? Should I get into the market now? So what if you try to time the market? I mean, I just took this from uh, somewhere, but... Uh, Okay, so if you have tried to time the market, okay, if you didn't time the market, you are just, you hear stories of grandmothers who hold shares for a long time and became millionaires, right? Because they didn't read the news, they don't know what's happening, they just hang on there, they just buy and hold. So this is $10,000 invested from 1980 to 2021, 40 years, buy and hold. If you invested all the time, you'll be, you end up with 1 million. If you have tried to time the market and you miss the best five days, you end up with 670,000. And you're trying to, to time the market and you miss out the best 10 days, you end up with just $487,000. So I think it is hard to time the market and it is better not to time the market if you are not an expert investor. So for us, we don't time the market. We are more or less fully invested all the time. So what about recession, right? So do you invest during a recession? I think it's not surprising to know that if you invest during a recession like now or impending re recession next year, you are going to make the best, uh, you are going to make good returns uh, one year later. If you look at it, you, the green bar is when you invested during the recession and you are getting 18%. And uh, three years later is 13.8%. So it makes sense to, these charges tells you that it makes sense to invest during a recession. Okay, so people, they are concerned. Okay, um, they are concerned about inflation. So this inflation is coming, interest rates are going up. So stocks are not going to do well, right? 
So let's get away from stocks. Maybe put money to gold or commodities or whatnot. So let's look at the long-term picture. These are the various stock markets on the left from Australia all the way to the US. And let's break down into three periods. The first one is 1946 to 1971, that's 25 years. 1946 to 1971, that's 25 years. And during that period, you can see that stock investing in the stock markets will give you on average between five to 6% return. These are real returns. And after that, you see 1972 to 1979, 79, for seven years. These are the inflationary periods, right? So obviously, you look at the UK and US is minus five, minus three. So yeah, you get negative returns from the stock market, real returns during inflationary period. But what about the next 40 years? That means the last 40 years, 1980 to 2020. So you get positive returns as well. So average about seven, eight percent or so. So you look at the big picture. The big picture is that, you know, you are getting positive returns from stocks for 65 years. And only seven years during inflationary period, you are getting so-called very lackluster returns. So do you want to make the call that for the next seven years, we are going to get inflation, so we stay away from stocks? Does the investor want to make this call? Okay, now I go into the details. What happened from 1972 to 1979, right? Okay, look at the... Um, um, 1972, 1979, the yellow, the yellow box. Just look at that. This was the hyperinflation period. Look at the S&P 500. In 1972, it's 118. Then after that, 97, 68, 90, 107, blah, blah. 1979, 107. So can you see that the S&P 500 from 1972 to 1979, it went nowhere. It stayed the same, right? So if you are invested in a stock market, yeah, it stayed the same. And you factor in inflation, you, you will end up with a small loss. So you may, you may conclude that, you know, it's bad. But if you look at the underlying, look at the earnings. I mean, look at the earnings in 1972. That's earnings per share. $6 per share. Then after that, $8. Then $9. Then $7. $9. $10. $11. $14. And $55. Earnings actually increased during this period. So what, basically what is the bottom line? Earnings, the bottom line is earnings are increasing, right? But stock prices didn't increase. So this is during the inflationary period. So like I said, you remember the perpetual energy machine, reinvested earnings, bigger base, reinvested earnings. So that's why earnings kept increasing. So earnings wise, everything was fine and dandy, but stock price wise, it wasn't. Now you look at subsequent period, 1980 to 1991. Okay, this is back with a vengeance, right? The S&P 500 in 1980, 135 points. At the end of 1991, it's 400 points. It went up three and a half fold during this period. So now, really back with the engine because the earnings are exploding. I mean, earlier period, the accumulated earnings, they are exploding and the ROE and all that. So it couldn't contain this very powerful force. So that's why, you know, money grew fourfold during this, in the subsequent period. But interestingly, if you look at earnings during this period, $15, $15, $13, 13, from 1980, yeah. $15, $15, $13, $13, $16. $13. So basically earnings didn't go very bad anywhere, right? But the stock market exploded fourfold. So why? Number one, it could be because from 1972 to 1979, during the inflation years, it was suppressed. And after that, it came back with a vengeance. Then why earnings didn't increase? Oh, during this time, the, 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 the Japanese, uh, uh, Automakers went into the US, make the cars in the US, and that may have uh, eroded some of the, their, 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 their margins. But if you just really want to look at the big picture, in 1991, at the end of it, earnings was like $19. And in 1970, it's $6. So it has basically gone up threefold. 
So it makes sense to invest uh, in stocks, right? So then you may ask, okay, I won't go through this. It's just bonds. You can see bonds basically is negative returns. Only in the last 40 years, uh, bonds did well, you know, but still bonds lost out to equities. Okay, the surprise is what about commodities? Let's invest in commodities, right? So you look at the last many years of commodities, right? So the last 40 years, commodities on average, 40 years, uh, uh, for most of it, you can see that commodity returns are hardly keep up with inflation. In all the columns, it's actually negative. The only time when commodities beat um, other asset class is just seven years from 1972 to 1979. So there, I'll leave it to you whether you want to make that call for these next seven years to repeat itself. So another favorite question, is the market cheap or expensive? Yeah. So when you enter the market, you just want to know whether is it cheap or expensive, right? You need to know uh, what are the levels of the market. So a quick one, uh, you look at the MSCI uh, Asia, the PE on the right, right part of it, the PE is uh, um, 14 times. So that's considered fair, it's not expensive. And uh, if you look at, remember the ROE and the perpetual energy machine, right? So what is Asia currently earning? So the ROE is actually 10%. So which means that ROE is still very much intact at 10%. What about the US? The okay, US, the PE is 20 times. And guess what? The ROE is 20%. So I leave it to you to guess why ROE, that means the earning power of US companies is at 20% and why Asia is at 10%. Why? the capital efficiencies of, a, of the US is a lot superior to Asia. This is the big picture, the historical picture, world index. So we look at the world index of PE, this is a barometer. Look at it, now we are at like 17 times. So in June, maybe we are at 16 times. So we are at the lower band of the average PE. Average PE is about 20 times. So we are at the lower band. That's a world index. And, um, if you look at the Russell 3000, that's the US. So we are at 21 times. Average is about 24 times. So by any stretch, valuations are not expensive. Asia pack, where we have a lot, is, uh, is uh, 12 times PE. Average is about 20 times. So market, sorry, so market valuation wise, we are not we are not really stretched. We are just quite reasonable and maybe on the lower side. So if you want to time the market using market valuations, I don't see a reason not to uh, invest in stocks. I don't see any reason to sell your stocks. Yeah, that's all I have for you. Uh, pass it on to Harold. Thank you very much, um, Eric. And I think after that, we need a short break to digest everything he said. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker is Harry. Um, Harry, this is giving away his vintage, has 25 years of cumulative experience in new business development, listing companies, managing M&A, and strategy consulting. Um, with his co-founders, he successfully listed an e-learning company in Malaysia and sold it um, to a family office. As a venture uh, builder for an Indonesian family office, he has spearheaded several ESG-linked projects particularly in water treatment, viral prevention, and agrotech in Asia. He's currently um, co-lead instructor in the NS Graduate Research Innovation, um, Innovation Program to jumpstart deep tech ventures, many of which are AI-centric. Harry's presentation is on what's machine learning got to do with it. And of course, the title is a big giveaway Well, to our vintage. It's a Tina Turner number from the 1980s, wasn't it? Well, thank you. Oh. Right. Yeah, this is a very inspired title. The, the original title is using machine learning to enhance stock portfolio performance. But our very creative uh, marketing team thought that this is a better title. So 
what's machine learning got to do with it? And I'm sure Tina Turner's song is ringing at the back of your head and you recognize the uh, cultural reference. It means that you have certain seniority or you can pretend that you never heard it and you only know uh, Taylor Swift songs. So without further ado, let's dive in. So the objective today is very simple. Three things, right? We have five fingers, but I can remember three things. Number one is what is machine learning? I'm going to demystify machine learning because when we think about artificial uh, intelligence, machine learning is a subset of it. We always think this is in the realms of data scientists, programmers, hackers, those guys with their hoods on their head. Um, it's not true. It's something that is quite simple. Uh, anyone who spends a little bit of time is able to grasp the fundamentals of artificial learning as well as machine learning. Number two, I will talk about how we use machine learning in aggregate. Uh, personally, I do not like black box method because it's like a magic box and you just put things inside the black box and things happen. You have to understand before you can invest. So we're going to share how we build our machine learning. Number three, which is most important is the future. What it means to you as investors, you know, in this backdrop of very turbulent times. So just three things. Now, uh, Professor Kishore has so eloquently uh, uh, given us a framework of, of the, the challenges and the issues that we face right now uh, and all the flashpoints as well. And Eric has spoken about uh, the perpetual energy machine. Can't apply in physics and chemistry, but you can apply this in finance. So another thing we should think about is markets actually rotates between growth and value. As you can see from the, the, the diagram, uh, the blue section represents periods in which value strategies do better. And you look at the orange section, those are periods in which growth strategies do better. So it rotates between the two. And as you can see from the last 10 years or so, in fact, more than 10 years, the markets has been going through a growth strategy period and probably fueled by the tech boom that we see. So just buy your tech stocks, your Fang stock, your Facebook, your Alibaba, your Amazon and uh, Netflix, and you're going to do pretty well. And the question right now is that, are we reverting back to the value phase? So just for reference, uh, as of July, the first uh, Amazon has fallen 40% from the peak, Netflix 70% down, and Bitcoin, which perhaps is uh, representative of the excesses of the uh, tech boom, is down by 70%. So that gives you a perspective of why markets will always rotate between the two, growth and value. So what's the challenge? The challenge is this. Is there a way to pick stock regardless of the rotation between growth and value, right? Uh, I'm sure those who have just joined us, uh, our aggregate, right, has always uh, started off as a, a very strong uh, tenant as a value fund. So do we have to wait for years before the value period kicks in. So can we have the best of both worlds? Meaning that uh, value and growth, we will do well in the portfolio. So that's the first challenge. Now, the second challenge is actually us human beings, our human limitation. Now, a typical stock analyst will look at maybe 10, 15 financial ratio indicators before he makes his uh, uh, stock selection. The thing is, human beings cannot handle too many variables. Now, let me illustrate this. Uh, look at the, the, the chart on the, on the right. Um, I'm sure you've done this in chemistry and second uh, and physics experiment in school, right? You're supposed to plot the line and we start shifting uh, the, the variable so that we have the perfect linear and, and curved line. And we all do that in school. So that's something that we can visualize. But what about two variables? Two variables, you need a 3D chart. Then what about 50 variables? Your mind can't even visualize it, right? So the famous uh, Pharma and French academic paper about investing in small cap stocks and uh, a low price to book ratio, that's only two variables. But let's challenge ourselves. Is it possible to have, let's be greedy, the sum of all things, right? Everything and the kitchen sink in our analytical model. Can we do that? So, and the answer, and the only answer is we need machine learning to help us. 
right? Not because our methodology is wrong, it's because we need the machine to be able to handle all these variables. So machine learning, which is a subset of AI. So what does AI do? We watch too many Hollywood movies uh, in which uh, Skynet, Terminator, and for those who love classic movies, uh, uh, Hell 9000, uh, Space Odyssey 2001. So all these machines will take over the world. But in truth, AI is really good for three things, right? Number one, they learn from the past input. They adjust to new inputs. And more importantly, they perform human-like tasks. They're not God-like machines that take over the world. They replicate what we do, but in a more efficient and faster way. That's it. So where uh, aggregate is right now is we are at the machine learning level, which is a subset of AI. And uh, in months or even years to come, we will go into deep learning, which is even harder, which is even uh, 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 more, uh, more accurate in its predictive ability. So AI, what is AI good at? AI is really good at classification. Now think of a scenario where you tell your child, can you tell the difference between a cat and a dog? And what do you do? You bring him to the zoo, bring him to the pet store or show him pictures, right? And the kid get it immediately, one or two pictures. But AI is not so clever. They need tons and tons of, of sample data to train it, to understand the ability to differentiate the cat and the dog. But once they get it, they get it very fast. So right now, the technology, we're talking about 97% accuracy if you use AI to differentiate the, the, between a cat and a dog. And this is something that we've been doing. AI classification, we've been, we've been using AI classification all the time. Think about Facebook, right? Facebook, well, you know, is, Facebook is about pattern recognition. It knows what you... Uh, who are your friends, who are your family, who are the people you want to show off so that you can show off your, your every night, your meal is amazing, right? You have Amazon, who actually is a pattern recognition of your purchasing pattern, Tesla, road recognition. So ultimately, pattern recognition is still about classification, which is what AI is about. That's what they're good at. So I think one of the webinar participants asked a very good question. It says, can you show us statistics of how you apply uh, uh, AI to finance. What's the validity, right? So here's a number. This is a shocking number. This is from Forbes. 85% of AI projects fail in the real world, 85%. So whatever you use right now, whatever you see that works, right, is that rare 15%. And if you're talking about specialized projects, specialized areas like finance, it's probably five or 10%. So it's a rare, rare breed, right? So you, tech, you go for a tech uh, a forum, tech competition, you hear all this AI this, AI that, but AI that work is rare. So that's the 85% project failure rate. And also there's a checklist. It's very important when someone says AI, you have to ask four questions. Has the AI been trained? What is the size of the data set? If you just test it for one month or one year, that is not good enough. And how rigorous is the testing? And ultimately, right, what is outcome? There must be a positive outcome that it can really help you in your daily life. If not, then AI is pointless. So four questions. So before embarking uh, on this AI journey with aggregate, uh, I, I, I thought that uh, that's how you apply AI in finance this way. So you put in your stock market data, your market indices, your company financial, the macroeconomics uh, 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 indicators, and the kitchen sink and everything. You just plonk it into your, this magic machine called AI. And the output is that you can pick the top 10 performing stocks. I think a few questions from the webinar participant asked for that, right? And not only that, you can tell uh, at 4 p.m. next Thursday what's the price of Netflix. This will fail. It's not possible because you're asking the AI to do more than it could, right? Let's look at it this way. These are three stocks, Hershey, Duke Energy, and Netflix. Even human beings, just with six variables, human beings can't answer this quickly, right? Uh, look at Netflix, operating income growth is 90%. Obviously, it's a good stock, but now, not so good. Maybe I should go into Hershey or Duke Energy because the PE is low. So as human beings, we can't 
decide quickly and you want the AI to do this? Another uh, challenge is this. It's a question of time. I know that's a patch mode song, question of time. And if you look at Netflix, right? Yeah, just last, last year is the darling of uh, analysts. I love Netflix and it makes sense. Because COVID, people stay at home, they watch more stream services. And even if we go back to office, uh, back to, the, to office or schools, they will continue sub, uh, subscribing to the service. But now we know that uh, good content is hard to produce. There's only so many, uh, what, Queen's Gambit or Umbrella Academy, right? And I'm sure right now you run out of things to watch. And now you hate Netflix because the share price has fallen. So what is the problem here? The problem is actually noise. There is too much noise in financial data. The statistical speed is there is a very low signal to noise ratio, but uh, the layman would just call it too much noise in financial data. Therefore, it's very hard to apply AI in finance. But is there a better way? And this is the aggregate way. We have figured a way out to use machine learning and let's dive in how we do it. And it's going to sound like, looks like a, a cooking show. We're going to show you step, like just what Eric did. Step one, step two, step three, all right? Okay, so this is how we go, go about this. So the five steps uh, process. So step number one, we call this feature engineering. So remember the AI does what humans do, right? So we feed the same data as what the analyst will require. And just for as an indication, we have 50 fundamental indicators. We have 50 technical indicators and 50 financial journals indicators. Now, financial journal indicators, these are professors, these are researchers who spend decades of their life studying a particular phenomenon. And not to include that wisdom in your engine doesn't make sense. Of course, we should include that. So we are, we are agnostic in that sense. We put all the information in and we see which one works. That's step number one. Step number two is we classify the stocks, right? By good versus bad, cat versus dog, remember? So we split a stock, say 1,000 stocks into two halves, right? So the first half is the 500 stocks. We call them good stocks. We ask the machine learning to pick more here. And below the line, we draw a horizontal line. We call it the median or middle line. Below, we call them bad stocks. And we ask the machine learning, please pick less stocks here. So basically, we have converted a complex problem into something very simple, a classification, cats and dog. I need you to hold that thought. Next thing is we ask the machine to rank all the stocks in descending order from the high. So stock A will be the highest probability above the middle line. Stock O, the red, will be the lowest probability above the middle line. So we rank them in this descending order, right? And after this, we will find out each stock return and see if we are able to get a pattern, a consistent pattern. So the next thing is, remember the checklist? We have to test our data. We have to test our uh, machine learning in a very rigorous way and we do it we call this the walk forward test. So how does walk forward test do is we train the data from 207, 2008, 2009, and then we compare to 2010. And then the next year, we add one more year, 2010, and then we compare it to 2011. It's almost like your 10 year series exam, right? Every year you do one more year exam and see how well you do. So that is how rigorous that it, our testing is. We call it the walk forward testing, but that's not good enough. We want to test our machine learning to the point of failure, right? So one country, you know, every country has its own characteristic, it's a stock market characteristic. Not good enough. We want to do it in 16 countries. That is how rigorous our back testing is. So Singapore, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, so on and so forth, Germany. And we even include STOXX, which is a, in a European index. So we want to test it. And now, step number five how do we know that our machine learning actually works, right? So if the actual result of the stock ranked by our machine learning shows a descending curve, it simply means it works. Statistically, we call this a monotonic relationship. I know it sounds like a, a new tonic. No, monotonic comes from the word monotonous. 
So it's a curve or a straight line. So if you see this, this line, it shows that our machine learning works. Uh, so let's think of, uh, show you an example where it doesn't work, right? So if we see a random pattern, then our machine learning has failed because there's no consistency, right? So this is a non-monotonic uh, relationship where you see a random pattern. And here comes the most important thing, the results. The results is everything. So we have compiled a table. Now the table is a bit complex, but not to worry, we will plot the charts. So we are looking at a sample of 10 countries. We have 16 countries, but there's too much data. So we just take a sample of 10 countries. These are actual average one year return from 208 to 2021. So that's about 13 years. So we break down the universe of stocks per country into 10 baskets. That's why I call it decile. Decile is just 10% of, uh, of the universe of stocks per country. And then we calculate the grand total return for that 10% uh, versus the average country return, which is at the bottom, right? Now, the thing is that this is what we see, right? When you plot the chart, when you see this, you must be convinced that only conclusion is that our machine learning works because you see a monotonic relation in all the 10 countries and region. And it's not a perfect line. If it's a perfect line, I'll be worried. That means there's something wrong with our model. It's too perfect. But you see a consistent descending curve in all the markets. And it's beyond a reasonable doubt that our machine learning works. We are in that rare 5 10% of machine learning projects that works in the world. And in fact, when I saw this, when Eric showed this to me, I was like, yeah, it was an open mouth, jaw drop moment. I said, you know what? I have to work with, uh, work for uh, aggregate. Now, same table, uh, same table, but now we look at the uh, top 10%, which is called DESA one. And then we look at the average return of each market. And then we do a comparison. So you can see from this table, if you have put money in DESA one, which is the top 10%, above the middle line, remember, these are the high probability stocks, you get 11.7%. The market, if you just put all your money in all the markets, right, you'll get 5.6%. So you have an outperformance of 6.1%, a delta of 6.1%. Now, the thing is that it's very important to understand the limitation, the caveats is that if the market is down by 10%, even if you outperform by 6%, it's still minus four. So there's no magic bullet here. There's no magic tree here or fairy tale here, right? But the thing is that over time, we can deliver these results quite confidently. Now, what in every PowerPoint, there's always one slide that's most important. Now, this is the most important slide, right? Our biggest, biggest discovery, right? And thanks to the pioneering work of Eric, uh, uh, David, and, and, and Jimmy, and the rest of the team, we found out that there are certain indicators that can cause stock prices to move. This is a 200-year-old puzzle. Why 200 years? Because the US stock market was founded what, 230 years ago. So every textbook is always wondering what causes share price to go up. And we found it, right? So if you look at the chart on the right, this is a heat chart. So the dark blue section are those indicators that are impactful to stock prices. And then below, those are uh, indicators that are not so important. So we found out um, with the permission of Eric, uh, I'm going to share a, proprietary, a bit of proprietary information here. We found out that research and development expenses divided by uh, uh, market capital, that means your R&D spending, is a very important component in deciding share price movement. Then you say, oh, that's easy. That's kept it obvious. You spend more money in R&D, uh, more uh, innovation, more new products and higher revenue and better profitability. Right? That's Captain Obvious, nothing new. This is not what we found out. We found out that if you combine research and development expenses to two other indicators, we call the cluster functionalities, this will impact how share price goes up. So we know it's, it's amazing when we, we found this. And, in, and this is not the only cluster. There are multiple clusters that we found that actually cause 
prices to move. So this is our biggest discovery. Without hyperbole, this is something like, it's almost like uh, Santa Claus tuck his uh, uh, a sledge on top of your roof and uh, you have endless treasure information. So what do we do with all this information? Again, Captain Obvious, instead of buying the top 10%, just buy the top 1% of the highest probability above the line. So say the US stock market has uh, 3,000 stocks. So 1% uh, is 30 stocks. And then what Eric says, you uh, diversify in 10 or maximum 20 countries. So just repeat this strategy by the top 1% in each country's stock market and repeat this in 10, 20 countries. That's it. It's not too complicated. But the mathematics, the science behind this, well, that's difficult. So let's talk about why are we unique? So now you understand the uniqueness, um, secret source of uh, our machine learning algorithm is that by asking our machine learning to pick group A, uh, the highest probability above the middle line, we inadvertently or indirectly succeed in picking the best performing stocks. And yet, making the machine learning do what it does best, classification, dog and cat, right? Now, however, there's no magic crystal ball or there's no fairy tale here. We still need time and diversification for this to play out. But we are confident that over time, we will win. So let's talk about the future, what it means to, uh, to you as investors. Um, so the question, uh, uh, people, uh, investors always ask is, what if the entire global market undergoes cataclysmic changes as uh, Professor Kishore has already painted the world is turbulent enough. There's a Ukraine war, there's Taiwan-China flashpoint, there's US deflation, there's tech stock bloodbath, there's DeFi revolution. Uh, I still remember Thomas uh, Friedman used to say, uh, you know, this McDonald theory, if country A has McDonald, country B has McDonald, a and B will not fight, but now we know they do, right? Russia and, uh, and, and Ukraine. Uh, DeFi revolution, buy cryptocurrencies, and you don't have to buy stocks. Why buy stocks? Crypto is the future, right? And uh, it's a best defensive uh, asset, if you can call that an asset. And it didn't work out that way when the stock market fell, so did uh, uh, cryptocurrency. So the fair question to ask is, can any human being any human analyst do better? The answer is probably not, right? And another thing, uh, uh, important tenant in aggregate is that our, safety, our biggest safety net is still diversification. Diversification, diversification, and diversification. And our AI will learn to adjust and recognize the new pattern very quickly. Another question asked by, by uh, uh, Participants, this question always come almost 100%. It's like the elephant in the room is what works in the past may not work in the future, right? But let's not forget that our investment methodology, the tenets, the philosophy in aggregate has not changed. The AI merely does the same task, except that the human analyst cannot handle 150 variables, while machine learning can. And uh, our fund managers will filter out the stocks. There's a human layer that are deemed high risk out of the portfolio. So they don't wake up in the morning and this Terminator generate 20 stocks and, the, and our analysts will just buy the 20, our fund managers just buy the 20 stocks blindly. There is a human input involved. And last and but not least, diversification has not been abandoned. There is very little over-concentration risk in aggregate. It's very much reduced. So if, even if there's a black swan event, remember we are diversified in 13 countries currently and there'll be more and therefore we are safe. So that is uh, the summary of this. Uh, uh, my, my session is this. Number one, machine learning is an enhancement and not a replacement of our investment strategy. Number two, we actually know the clusters of indicators that will drive stock prices up or down. And number three, we are doing this continually to improve our model, our analytical abilities. So um, I quote here, Robert Frost, Mouse to go before I sleep. I know my colleagues, they, don't, they hardly sleep. And uh, this is, of course, for our investors. And uh, this is really the time to seek investment, uh, not to run in fear. And think about this, this is what 
this uh, webinar is about today, managing global uncertainties, seizing global opportunities. So this is the time not to run away, but go for it. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Harry. We, that, that was very uh, fascinating. That was, all three of you are very, very good. But before I start with the Q&A, and this is totally unexpected, can I ask you a couple of questions, burning questions? You said one, R&D was very important. R&D over market cap. What were the other two? The other two is proprietary. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> okay. And the, other, the other question. Of yeah, course, I thought is, so too. <laughs> yeah. And the other question was, uh, may I turn your book on its head? Yeah. Can machines think? Not yet. So far, no machine has been able to pass the Turing test. But uh, you watch enough movies, they say at some point, there will be a, a machine that can think. So I, I'm, I'm glad it hasn't happened. Otherwise, there won't be a job for all of us. Oh, gosh. Okay. So for your yeah. next book after your memoirs, maybe <laughs> <laughs> can machines think. All right. So now um, all our um, attendees, our signups, sent in their questions. And uh, we've, we'll, we can't answer all, but we have some uh, interesting ones here. And the first one, of course, is for you, a prop. Uh, given the backdrop of the Ukraine-Russian war, uh, the commitment by global economies to move to a net zero uh, carbon situation by 2050 and uh, interim targets by 2030 and its impact on the Russian economy, how will the Sino-Russian axis develop and how will this affect well, ASEAN? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this is a rather complex question. I'll break it down into three parts, okay? One is about climate change, mm -hmm. which is race. Number two, about the Sino-Russian access. Number three, about yeah. Yes, and energy and energy. Yes, uh, the, the, the energy and climate change and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's very clear that, you know, there have been many negative consequences of the Ukraine war. I discussed many of them earlier. Inflation, rising food prices, poverty, and so on and so forth. But I think one of the uh, other negative results of the Ukraine war is that there has been a setback uh, in the commitment by the major economies to uh, you know, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And even the European countries are going back to coal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the European countries have always set the gold standard in a sense for trying to meet the uh, climate change targets. As a result of the Ukraine war, as a result of the reduction of purchases of uh, Russian energy supplies, they're switching to alternative energy supplies, although they can't give up on Russian gas, by the way. And so as a result of that, they're going back to coal, and that, of course, is going to increase greenhouse gas emissions, and so on and so forth. So on the climate change side, definitely uh, there has been a setback as a result of the uh, Ukraine war. Now, on the Sino-Russian access, as I said in my remarks earlier, it is not quite an access. It's, uh, I think it's a temporary uh, partnership, but it's one where they, in the short term, they have common uh, interests, but in the long run, it's not clear that it will be a, a permanent uh, access. And if you look at the long run, one, one factor that I didn't bring up uh, which I think is important for our listeners to also know, because it's important to understand that if you look at the big picture, the reason why living in 2022 is so confusing is because there are fundamental sort of turning points in human history that we are experiencing at the same time. And one of the most fundamental turning points that we are experiencing is the uh, what I call the return of Asia. You know, this is the subject of my book, the Asian 21st Century. Essentially, from the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. So it's only in the last 200 years that the West has taken off. But the past 200 years of uh, Western domination has been an aberration. And it's actually happening at the same time. And it, it was going to happen anyway, with or without the Ukraine war and so on and so forth. It was going to happen. It is happening right now. And if you want to anticipate where the growth of the future is going to come from, uh, I actually have created a new phrase. I say it's going to come from the new CIA. Now, CIA doesn't stand for 
uh, Central Intelligence China Agency. ASEAN, it stands for China Indian ASEAN. China India ASEAN. Why, wow, God, she's brilliant. <laughs> I'm not. I just pretend to be everybody. I just pretend. <laughs> so, anyway, clearly, the, I, would, I, I can confidently make a prediction that over the next uh, 10 to 20 years, the major uh, engines of global growth will be uh, China, India, uh, and ASEAN. And just to give you one statistic that will shock you, you know, the EU has a $15 trillion economy. ASEAN only has a $3 trillion economy. ASEAN is only one-fifth of the European Union. But over the last 10 years, the EU contribute more to global economic growth or ASEAN contributed more? The answer should be EU. The correct answer is ASEAN. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Yeah, so can I just ask, so, but for this growth, we need peace and prosperity. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, do you really think, which the West has also blown up to a great extent, that there could be a China-Taiwanese conflict? Because that would set mm -hmm. us back forever, won't it? Uh, yes, there's always the danger of uh, a China-Taiwan conflict. But if you ask me to predict whether a war is like many people predicted, by the way, of course, this is the usual Anglo-Saxon commentators, you know, oh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. If we don't stop Russia's invasion of Ukraine, China will invade Taiwan. And, and that shows a complete lack of understanding of how the Chinese think. You know, the, 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 the one thing that the West doesn't understand is that China has been around for three to 4,000 years. And the Chinese have a very long-term perspective. And the Chinese also believe that the best way to win a war is to not fight it. So if they can get back Taiwan slowly, gradually, without fighting a war, that's the way they should do it. And so the, if, if the Chinese believe that time is on their side, uh, then there's no need to rush. And you must remember, therefore, that when, you, when, when the Europeans take what Russia did and apply to China, they don't understand there's a fundamental difference uh, between Russia and China. Russia, sadly, is a declining power. You know, it, it is, its relative power in the world is going to shrink. China is a rising power. And within 10 to 15 years, China will be the number one economic power in the world. So time is working on China's side. Why should China jeopardize it all by invading Taiwan? Of course, the only caveat I'd add to that is that if Taiwan declares independence tomorrow, China will invade Taiwan tomorrow. That's clear. But, but if, and, I, and I don't, I think the Taiwanese know this. <laughs> so they're going to be very, very careful before taking any such step. And also, of course, the Chinese economy is very diversified. The Russian economy just is based yeah. on oil and gas. The, the Chinese okay. economy is much, much bigger than the Russian economy. Yes, yeah, so that's why there's a joke of North China is Russia. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the next uh, question we have here, thanks very much for that, Prof. Um, okay, so this has come from, from, from our attendees. With failed businesses like uh, Zilingo and greenwashing, um, how do retail investors evaluate the authenticity of financials and ESG metrics um, by companies? I think we... Uh, Eric, yeah, uh, you? Oh, you, okay. Uh, we're, we're all citizens of planet Earth. Uh, whether you're in fund management or not, doesn't matter. And obviously, uh, ESG metrics are important. Um, just now, but here's the challenge, right? The challenge is that if you look at the, uh, the SDG, Sustainable uh, Developmental Goals, right? Uh, there's 17 goals. Uh, you know, the colored picture with all the, the multiple goals. The problem is that everyone knows that the goals are important, is crucial, for the survival of the human race, but we do not know the exact parameters. We have spoken to a few uh, experts, uh, uh, Aggregate has spoken to a few experts, and, few, and one of the challenges that they face is, what are the exact parameters? As, as you all know, right, uh, because we use machine learning, uh, Aggregate uh, uh, tenants, right, investment tenants, always data-centric. So if we do not have enough information, and the information is, is, so, is still, uh, uh, work in progress. Uh, it's still uh, 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 
developing, then it's very hard to make a, a call and say, no, this is the parameters that we want. These are the shares that we will not invest. These are the shares that we will invest. And then the second issue, which uh, uh, the, 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 pers the, uh, the, uh, the participant has, has uh, correctly pointed out is that uh, there's this issue about white, uh, greenwashing, right? Greenwashing is that a lot of time we have to consider the entire ecosystem of the company. If the company say we're switching to, to electric car, that doesn't mean that the company is green, right? So you have to look at the whole uh, ecosystem of the company and that's difficult. The data is difficult. Now, are we not doing anything? No, we are doing something. So for example, I think our SGX is very forward looking. Uh, I think next year, uh, uh, climate reporting, I believe is compulsory. So the stock exchanges are moving towards the right direction. And as a fund, uh, we, and especially we use machine learning, we are developing our algorithm to take these inputs in, uh, but it is work in progress. We we'll wait and see, but once it's ready, of course, uh, we'll do something about this. Yeah. I think these companies have a lot of intangibles. And I think I was talking to Eric about this. So how do you value these intangibles? Um, because I read in your, uh, in, in, in that you sent out that you only look at NTA, so you take out things like goodwill and other intangibles. Um, and a lot of companies like, well, Netflix, Twitter, last night, Elon Musk said he's not buying Twitter now. So all, a lot of these companies have lots of intangibles. So how do you value those eyeballs, etc.? Mm. I mean, admittedly, valuing intangibles is quite hard. And sometimes uh, it requires a leap of imagination to be able to value companies uh, with uh, lots of intangibles. So for us, we prefer to be on the safe side. We like to look at cash flows. So cash flows, the generation of free cash flows over equity, over market cap is an important uh, measure for us. So that is one of our uh, basic criteria. So if um, somebody wants to make a call on you know, a company that has lots of intangibles, maybe you will contribute to future cash flows and no cash flow at the moment. So we will say, just be cautious have a small, you, you, may, you may want to limit your exposure to that, you know, again, that diversification thing that we talked about. So just limit your exposure. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. So the next question is still with, with uh, financials. Um, what will be the key growth drivers in the next two years in the general economy, in particular the technology sector? And what are the investment opportunities based on, on this outlook? Prof, would you like to... Uh, uh, give some suggestions on growth drivers in the next two years that you can see with your... Um, no, I think one growth driver for, especially for, you know, I believe the next growth region is the CIA, right? Mm. San China, India, ASEAN. And it's quite amazing that this triangle is, you know, they're very close to each other. And there, you see, there comes a point in the development of a country as you know, in China, there were 800 million people in poverty and they have been rescued now. And then as they keep rising, they, they have a tipping point, they just join the middle class. And suddenly they have income. In the past, they would just use their income for the basic necessities, you know, food, shelter, education, and so on and so forth. But there comes a tipping point where they, suddenly the income comes and then they have surplus income. And they begin to join the middle class. And when that happens, that creates a new spurt of growth. And what's happening in simultaneously, and you, know, you must remember that China's got 1.4 billion people, India's got 1.3 billion people, uh, ASEAN is uh, 700 uh, million people. That You add that all up, it comes to 3.4 billion people, about 40% of the world's population. And if this, if a larger percentage of this, you know, 3.4 billion people enter the middle class, then they then create a new growth uh, engine. And the effect is actually quite explosive. Let me just give you one more statistic so you understand what I mean. In the year 2010, uh, the retail goods market in China was only $1.8 trillion. And the US was $4 trillion. 2010, right? More than double that of China's. You fast forward 10 years, 
US retail goods market has gone up from 4 trillion to 5.5 trillion, a significant increase. But China's has grown from 1.8 trillion to 6 trillion, bigger than the US in the last 10 years. And clearly, <laughs> the retail goods market goes up. That's a huge uh, uh, boost for, for growth. You see, that's why, as you notice, the Chinese have switched to something called the dual circulation uh, strategy, which means that, yeah, yes, they're going to continue to grow by exports, but they're also going to grow to Domestic internal demand. demands, which they can, because the tipping point has come and they've created the middle class. So we have to see these long-term trends also, because they also affect growth so you prospects. Think it will happen with ASEAN, ASEAN's not. ASEAN and people. India, yeah. So India Amazing. will be a little later because it's... Sorry? Then India will be a little later. No, actually, because... India is, is going to be... It, it, it's traditionally being one of the most underrated economies. And the advantage that India is going to have in the next 10 years is that it's going to have a lot of political stability because Narendra Modi has proven to be a genius at winning elections. And because of that, it's likely that he's likely to remain in power for the next five to 10 years. And when you have that kind of political stability, it provides a foundation for economic growth, which is very critical. Technology, trends in technology that could um, cause greater growth than we've seen. Uh, you know, from our work, mm -hmm. we uh, started working on, you know, technology, machine learning, AI about uh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. So we can see that these, uh, um, machine learning, AI, statistical data analysis is going to be very huge in the future because you can apply it to so many areas. You can apply to medicine, you can apply to finance, you can apply to insurance, real estate and everything. So I think that's where um, having personally used it, I'm actually quite astounded by this uh, technology and I think it's going to contribute a lot in the future. So in terms of investment opportunities in, in this sector, I mean, is it, I, I, can't, I know that we can't talk individual stocks, but you know, the chip sector, would, it be, would there be investment opportunities in the chip sector or in the design, the chip design sector? Are these yeah. interesting areas to yeah. look at? You know, you know, for us, when we uh, look at technology, like I said, mm. we are kind of uh, agnostic mm. to certain sectors. We don't take a big position in each sector. Mm. So what we do is that um, um, when, we, when we do our uh, stock screening using uh, whatever tools that we have, we actually cluster it according to uh, industries. So we do pay attention uh, to industries. So like Harry, Harry uh, uh, say that, that 150 indicators, right? So there's actually captures uh, quite a lot of uh, industry information. So when that industry picks up or when that industry uh, demonstrates uh, that uh, it has good stocks, then it will automatically uh, fall into our system. So we don't do it such that we have industry experts in semicon. you know, the way that uh, not the traditional oh, right. fund okay. management is structured. You yeah. have a commodity expert and so on and so forth. For us, we do it such that whatever indicators, whatever parameters we want, that 100 word is all inside there. So if the industry picks up or that industry generates good cash flows, it generates good sales. So that would, if that is uh, classified as a good stock, then we will look into it. We are not, uh, because of our background, we are not experts in certain industries and we don't do it that way. Okay. So the next question, I think, has been answered. What's the next region where there could be an economic boom? Mm -hmm. That was yeah. for you and the CIA. CIA. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so will there be a recession? And if so, how serious would that be? Should we try or should we start with you, Harry? Right. You think? Uh, yeah, the, we, we looked through the, the question this and there's always this... Uh, <laughs> and he, he tied it to someone else, yeah. but anyway, that's why I There's, there's always, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, asking the analysts or fund managers to predict the future. Now, the thing is that, well, for the record, I did not... Uh, I lost a bet uh, on whether there's a Ukraine war. I thought that there can't <laughs> be one, and obviously I lost it. Um, the thing is that using... Uh, when, when you make predictions, right... Uh, especially uh, online right now, uh, it doesn't age very well, right? 
you can it, it's good to talk about the macro picture but once you talk about certain numbers certain markets certain stocks right um there's always this danger of uh, do you really know enough right and uh, the 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 market is very brutal these days they remember they, they can't remember when you make the right calls but they will make you into memes if you make the wrong calls but i think Let's go back to the fundamental of what uh, aggregate is. Aggregate has always been data centric. So the key question to ask yourself is that if you can predict what is the 10, a 10 percent increase or fall in mm -hmm. oil prices mm -hmm. or a recession or non-recession or inflation 3 percent versus 5 percent, what is the impact to your portfolio, to your individual stocks? I think that's the key question we should ask. And in aggregate right, we focus on the companies. First, as what Eric said, we are actually quite agnostic when it comes to the, uh, the sectors. And very interestingly, in our recent uh, uh, analysis, the, the machine learning, uh, looking at China, mm. um, two types of company came out more often than not. Uh, one is power, the other is uh, uh, steel, as in metal, steel uh, companies. They came out quite a bit. Now, are we going to make the prediction that uh, therefore, because of steel, there's a short commodities, then we can spin the story, right? Tell you how, therefore, there's inflation mm -hmm. or uh, power, we need power. We're not going to do that. We'll just look back at the company. So the very simple answer mm -hmm. to whether there is a, a recession or not, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But we'll still focus on the stocks because in uh, recession, there are companies that will do well, as what mm. Eric has shown. Mm. In, um, in stagflation, inflation, there are always companies that will do well. And we look at those companies. That's my answer. To add on, I think the stock prices, if you look at the valuation levels, mm. they have already priced in the recession. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything to add to this? No. Well, I would tell you just that uh, the conventional wisdom uh, is that a recession is coming. Mm. Uh, partly also because, as you know, we've had an exceptionally long period of growth without uh, a recession. And it's also clear that uh, lots of policy mistakes have been made uh, by the uh, Western countries. And clearly now, I think the Fed almost admits publicly that perhaps the stimulus package that they put in uh, after COVID was maybe too big. And, you know, as you know, Larry Summers, uh, the professor in Harvard, the former Treasury Secretary, was the first person to actually criticize the Fed for that. And he anticipated this inflation and he's been proven correct. So and now the Fed also acknowledges that maybe they have to do something about it. But this is where, frankly, if the West could learn that since they only represent 12% of the world's population, they should actually cooperate with the rest of the world. And, 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 and paradoxically, when we had our last major financial crisis mm -hmm. in 2008, 2009, it was a G20 meeting in London mm -hmm. that saved the global economy. Mm -hmm. So right now, if, if the United States was wise, if Europe was wise, they would work with the rest of the world to try and deal with this uh, recession. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. since the, they're bringing politics first instead of economics, they're pushing the Ukraine uh, issue and therefore they're alienating the rest of the world and therefore they're not getting global economic cooperation. So my, 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 uh, my big point to the West is, please look at the larger picture. Please understand that your own populations are gonna suffer so this recession mm -hmm. comes. So why don't you learn to cooperate with the rest of the world and especially with the second largest economy in the world with China? So West, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, the next question is, is about aggregate um, funds. So this is from one of the um, sign-ups. The funds from aggregate invest in more than 500 stocks per fund. Is that right? And that's, that's right. Okay, so you're, you're right. Uh, why did you structure your portfolio this way? It's more like an index fund. Is this meant to be a criticism? I hope it's not. It's more like an index fund instead of a fund with high conviction on its stock picks that are supposedly vetted by machine learning. I think you've got to answer that, that um, point. Yeah. Would it be you, yeah. Eric? Yeah. 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 So, okay, first, uh, like I said earlier, you want that 
9, 10% compounded returns. And to get that in a safe manner, you need lots of stocks. You want to invest in the aggregate economy, which is clocking at 8, 9, 10% ROEs, which translate to returns over the long term, right? So if you think about that, if you want to get onto this bandwagon or train, it makes sense to put in meaningful sums of money. You're not going to put in 50,000 bucks or 100,000 bucks. A lot of our clients put in the major bulk of their net worth with us. So what does that mean? So first is risk management, right? Mm -hmm. We try to protect that, right? So to protect that, that's why we have tens of countries. That's why we have hundreds or thousands of stocks to protect that. To protect that and to get onto that 10% bandwagon in a safe way. Of course, market downturns are that. That can't be helped. But over the long term, it should clock that. So first is protection. But if you have some gambling money, like 100,000, 50,000, you want a high conviction manager where the manager puts in 30% or 20% of his funds into a single counter, then there are other managers. There are a lot of managers who do that. And we are not that kind of people. We don't do that. Yes. Reverse, yes. right? More risk averse. Right. So um, talking about risk averse. So there's a question here on how can retirees best prepare for this higher inflation scenario? I think could you take that as well? We take that question. Yeah, because I, I just now earlier I showed that periods where there was a high inflation period, stocks went nowhere, right? It was like just uh slightly below minus one, minus two real return, right? So the thing is that do you want to switch out of stocks and hold cash and wait for a better time, hoping that you know uh, you can protect your, 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 your money and not suffer this uh, inflation and all that? But you can see that during that period of seven years, you can see that earnings continue to add on. And just now I show you the MSCI Asia. Yeah, we have recession, but we are clocking 10% returns on capital, meaning that the businesses are earning 10% per dollar. And in the US, they're earning 20 cents on the dollar. So do you want to miss these earnings? Because stock prices and earnings is completely divergent. It cannot, it cannot be together. So you just you do not want to get off the train. Just say you decide that you want a certain sum of your money, half of it, 50% in stocks. So you should stick to it. You should not deviate from this plan. Because you deviate from this plan, you know, you might not, you might miss the best uh, returning days, you know, and that will hamper your portfolio returns. So just stay invested. In yeah, business. just stay invested. Just so, go and ride your bicycle or something. Don't look at the stock. Okay. Is that, is that what your machine learning says as well? Yeah, yeah that's the best, best strategy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, um, there's a question here. What will a post-war global economy look like? Post-war global economy, post-Ukraine war. Yeah, post yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, oh, there are lots of little wars in Africa. Yeah, right? Which yeah, ignore yeah. Completely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, today as we speak, mm. uh, the Ukraine war looms very large. Mm. Partly because, I mean, to be honest, uh, you know, the Indian foreign minister, uh, Jai Shankar, said something very wise, you know. He said that Europe's Europe thinks that Europe's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not Europe's problems. Oh yeah, like there is a war in Africa. So, so I think in, you know he he was being quite critical uh, of the Europeans because they have, in a sense, hijacked the global agenda uh, with the Ukraine war, and even and when they criticize uh, India for buying Russian uh, energy supplies. He said, what uh, India buys in one month from Russian energy supplies, Europe buys in one afternoon. So clearly the Europeans uh, have double standards when it comes to criticizing other countries. So I think at the end of the day, I, the prediction I make is that if you take the long view of history, you know, which is what I tried to do in my book, uh, Asian 21st Century, which is available free of charge. The, in the long view of history, I, 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 what I assert is that the Ukraine war will be just seen as a small road bump mm. on the road to achieving the Asian century. Okay, so there we go. So, um, so we're gonna end, I think we have to end shortly. So 
would, this is our last question, and that's also to Prof. Sorry, I'm waiting for mm. news of you while you're here. Um, everyone is optimistic about China's growth. Are we overconfident? Has all this positivity been priced in? I think priced in in terms of valuation, I mean, the market, because I think recently the Shanghai market also recovered quite significantly. Any contrarian views to provide some food for thought to investors? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you can never, as you said, Harry said, you can know there's an, there's an Arab proverb which says, he who speaks about the future lies, even when he tells the truth, because <laughs> the, we always get surprises. And certainly it's possible that we can get surprises from China too. But at the same time, you know, we always tend to view things from a very short term perspective. But if you look at the longer history of China, they've had this incredible cycles. And when you have a good dynasty, it goes up for two to 300 years. And then, yeah, and then, and then it goes down for two or three, two or 300 years. And remember that China has went through one of the worst periods with the century of humiliation from 1842 to you know 1949 but now china is on an upward swing which will normally last about 100 to 200 years of which we have only seen 40 years yeah. so there will be bumps along the road for china but the, the, if you look against the backdrop the longer view of china i think china is going to have at least 100 good years so so i i think that 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 is a much more uh, important dynamic and china is at the end of the day she demonstrated that it is a strong learning civilization mm -hmm. is changing adapting and growing at the same time so i would say it's it's safer to overestimate china rather than to underestimate china um so do we stay invested and China is one of the, the countries that you have. I think yeah. somebody want, wanted to ask uh, how are we different from the index fund? Just now when you talk about yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, okay let's let's go back to that. So one. I didn't fully answer that. Oh, I'm sorry. So if I'm I show sorry. if I just now earlier I showed the uh, indices mm. where I just say you buy the Kospi, you are one quarter in uh, Samsung, mm. you buy mm. Taiwan, you are one quarter in uh, Taiwan semiconductors, mm. and you buy the S and P five hundred, you are like one third in tech. So why how we are different is that we don't we do not have any heavy weightage in any single uh, uh, stock. Again, that is to protect uh, the so-called retirement money. You know? yeah. It's so, so, so sort of yeah. like downside protection. Yes. And then the, there's some growth stocks yeah. for, for the upside. Like for example, in Hong Kong, you know, at one point I think 20% or 30% is in Tencent and Alibaba. You look what happened if you have you know, mm -hmm. uh, invested in those two companies, you have suffered, of course, yeah, yeah. and it's completely unpredictable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we don't we don't want to go there. And I just want to, to uh, echo uh, Eric, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, aggregate asset management. The word aggregate is staring yeah, in your true. face. <laughs> so we're telling you that we are focused on aggregation mm -hmm. and not over concentration. Mm -hmm. So and that's why it's in blue and it's right, you know, staring at our faces. Okay. All right. Okay. So, oh, we've got one minute left. Okay. Shall we one round? Um, how do you see um, Singapore managing through the, these turbulent times? I think. Prof. Well, actually, I I'm going to stick my neck out. Okay. And as he said, he's, the he's trouble not is that, he's not frightened. Yeah, like I know. He, 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 he didn't give a very important warning. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to say is going to become a meme that okay. will be you know there and then right. they say oh Kicho said this you know right. so i'm going to say that it's probable that singapore is going to enter another golden era of growth and not because of what we do of course what we do matters a lot but we just so happen we are strategically positioned to become the capital of the Asian century. You know, so just as London was the capital of the European century in the 19th century, just as New York was the capital of the American century in the 20th century, there will have to you will, people will look for a capital for the Asian century. And the most natural capital for the Asian century is Singapore. So you, you've already seen, mm -hmm. even in the last few months, a surge of new talent, new money, new investment 
coming to Singapore, you've seen what's happened to real estate prices in Singapore, you've seen, you know, what's happened to rentals in Singapore, that's a sign of a surge of confidence in Singapore that is that is happening now, which I think is an in indicator that people are going to take Singapore much more seriously in the next few decades. Okay, well, on that very good note, I think we can end, and these two are cowards, profits are uh, the only courageous one on this panel. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've come to the end of, our, of the webinar. Yeah. So I have, to, I have to say these things. So before you uh, go, please complete our survey. Once again, thanks for joining uh, the Edge Singapore in Aggregate Asset Management, and we hope to see you at our next event. Yeah, and have a very good long weekend, everyone.